Hey guys. Hey, if you are online, uh, let me know if the conference experience is not as good as you wanted it to be, because today I'm using a different internet service provider. So if this doesn't work, Nice, the way you expect it to be, then I will switch. Hello. Hey, David. How are you doing? Hey, David, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How's it going? Hey, good, good. Hey, I'm using a different internet provider today, and I just wanted to ask you if this is good or bad. Well, so far, so good. It's... Uh... It's not, as, it's not as jaggedy as it uh, usually is. Ha! Huh. Tell me again, what, what is uh, uh, the issue that usually you find? Um, I mean, the, the live stream sometimes goes a little, um, it lags, but that's not a non-issue. Your audio is perfect, so sometimes when I bring up your video, it's a little, you know, huh. a little laggish. But, Audio wise, it's perfect, and content wise, it's it's just fine. Okay, just my face doesn't move properly. <laughs> no, everything everything flows fine from a content perspective, and okay. audio is perfect. Huh. But if I blow up your your video, or yeah, it, it sometimes just it's a little sluggish. But that's a non-issue for me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you're basically telling me that the face that I show in that window, that video is a little bit slow sometimes, but the display of the screen is okay. Yeah. Yeah, your mouse tracking and everything else and everything flows fine. Nice, good to know. That That's the primary concern I have is to make sure that, uh, you know, my my handwriting, uh, mouses and, you know, all, all the display parts, they work correctly. That's my primary issue. And so I'm using a different internet service provider today, which means, you know, if something goes wrong, I will have to switch back. And that is something that I want to make sure that I tell you up front that it is a different company today. And that means that, you know, if something goes wrong, please tell me so I can switch and uh, make modifications accordingly. We'll be sure to give you some live feedback. Thank you, sir. And if, if that happens, we will have to break the connection, which means my recording will be split into two parts. But I guess I'll live with that. So uh, the recordings for the earlier sessions that we have had up until now have been migrated to this location that you probably see as this link and so I'm going to open it in a new tab so you're probably familiar with that idea already and what am I doing not here cloud technologies in that link you should be able to find all the videos at the very end at the very end you should see these sessions from fall 2016 that location that's where you will find all the video recordings uh, for the cloud technologies segment that we did and they are easy to access for you. They should just show up in that one location. You will also have access to the other recordings from previous, uh, like summer 2016 and winter 2016. I don't think you care, but I just wanted you to know that they're there. I don't think it becomes boring when somebody else's program, you're not participating. Why would you listen? I would not, but I'm just telling you that these videos are there. So you can, if you are, if you have ample free time, <laughs> like most of you do, uh, but I'm just joking. So having said, uh, I am going to ask you this question. Did you get a chance to read that uh, book summary, which I have been referring to in the last session a little bit? Like I mentioned in the cloud DevOps segment here, uh, the, the goal book and the book summary on SlideShare, if you have had a chance to review that, at least this summary here, or if not, this other summary that I have is a little bit descriptive uh, that may be of use and interest to you. So that's something that you should uh, take a look at and see if it makes sense. I, I am going to erase some accidental markings that I have here apparently. So I'm going to erase them out. Okay, good. So I just erase that. And uh, this, uh, if, if this tool of uh, annotation, if this annotation looks better for you, Please tell me that this is better than the other annotations that I do typically in this OneNote notebook that I have. 
Like if you remember this notebook that I occasionally, uh, I mean, almost every single time I use this. And what I have been doing it on, uh, what, is, what thing is this? You bypass this security check, accessibility. Okay, so in this, uh, okay, this Microsoft OneNote has logged me out apparently. So I will have to log back in. Error signing in, ouch. And I'm going to use in my work account and hope it lets me in. Okay, it asked me for a password. So I will provide that and then grab it from here and paste it and let's see, let's log in. Let's log in. So I'm waiting for a token authentication for it to complete and then I will approve that for this thing to let me in. And I think I just approved that one, so it should let me in. So the annotations that I have been doing all along is in this notebook that you probably have access to already. The question I have is, is that working any, any of you, is it of any use to you? The, these notes that I keep illustrating and writing that down, is that useful or not? That's one question. Is it useful? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, do yeah. you think? Oh, good to know. Good to know. So I will keep using that then. You know, if, it is, if you find, I thought you will not. This is the first time I'm using those OneNote notebooks. Ever since Microsoft has came out with this beautiful, beautiful support. Thank you, Microsoft. Uh, this thank you uh, for the use of pen on Mac. That is just wonderful. That's how I wanted this for so many years. So this pen on Macintosh that I have is a new feature that is now available on the Macintosh OS with Office, including OneNote. And that is just brilliant. So you finally supported that first class citizen, Macintosh and Office, sweet deal. Thank you, sir. Thank you everybody who did that. So that's what I'm using. And uh, if you like this method of annotation, great. The other, the other alternative I was talking about was this, this, uh, this transient one, which is, it goes away, you know, it doesn't stick. So the annotation like I have here, it will, it will uh, disappear on you if you, you know, if, after the meeting, it's only in the video that it gets recorded. So that is something that you may not want since you seem to like the other annotations better. So I will then keep using that and not worry about this annotation. Okay, good. A uh, couple other things. Uh, the, uh, the thing that I want to talk today is this extension of the idea that we discussed the last time, which was, I think you remember, and if not, I'll just give you a quick refresher, which is the whole purpose of making sure that we are enabling automation, essentially enabling the entire design of an application that you want to deliver to a customer. That application will require not only the source code for the app itself, but anything that make that is required to make it run all the dependencies, the underlying operating systems, and the underlying hardware, whatever it takes. Like hardware actually is in shape of, shape of cloud machines. Uh, that's, the, that's the hardware we actually typically use. We don't set up physical boxes anymore uh, because we let the people who are experts in ma managing, maintaining infrastructure, let them do it. So when I say hardware, I actually mean infrastructure as a service. And so setting up all these layers all the way to the top and making sure that each of these layers scale properly, scale uh, according to what the customer needs are, and orchestrating that, not just putting this component in a Git repository, but every single thing that builds the entire service, you have to put all these things inside a Git repository and very systematically, in a structured fashion, orchestrate delivering a service to the customer. That's the goal. That's the ultimate uh, in, in immediate short-term objective for the DevOps segment. We want to be able to understand, and not only that, practice. Practice this idea of, like, you know, just like developers put their source code of the application inside Git repository. That's great. That's only one piece. That's only one piece of the puzzle. 
everything that goes underneath, like all the dependencies, all the configuration. I did not write it properly. Dependencies, all the configuration that goes along, all the underlying machines that you may need, all of that underlying things that need to be in place. All of these things also need to be in a Git repository. Yes, this means you will put machines and the entire architectural layout around those machines also in a Git repository. Basically the whole package. And then service, provide that service that you want to give to your customer through all of these things. So in classic old days, you know, developers use source code and they manage their things in Git and you know, that, that, that was the piece of the puzzle and only a part of the game. The game today is like do the whole thing in the exact systematic structured fashion so that everybody is in on the same page, everybody is concurrently cooperating, collaborating to deliver that service to the end customer. And so what we intend to do is to, to enable this scenario, which is infrastructure as core. And you may have seen in the, in the website here, uh, some examples of what does that mean? And you know, what is programmable infrastructure and all that. And so there are these examples of you know, Chef and Puppet and Ansible and Salt and this and that and a bunch of other people who have created a bunch of open source products like Chef, this is Puppet, this is Ansible, this is Salt, this is CF Engine, this is very old, you know, very as in relatively old. This is Microsoft, PowerShell, PowerShell desired state configuration. And I think I like that word descriptive very much because it exactly very succinctly tell. This Babushka doll doesn't, meet, doesn't tell me exactly what it's going to do, but it's also a good product, uh, Babushka. Uh, the, the descriptive is right here. This is the word that I really like, except I would prefer that Microsoft uses shorter names for the products to make it easy for people to remember and easier for searches, so all these things. Now, the thing that we are talking about is this desired state configuration. That's the word I seem to like uh, as a description of what exactly we are doing because we are defining what is our desired state configuration of the entire service and put that in form of some code. And so you, you, you desire, whatever you desire, you put that in a Git repository and then you have some method of playing this idea. Play this idea and that basically creates and maintains your desire, whatever you desire. So you may, you may change your desire, like come back here and say, you know what, this desire is now old, I want a new desire here, new. So you can change your desire and this is the modification you will make to whatever you desire. And then you can play this again. And that maintains your new desire. So that's the desired state of the service that you want to deliver to your customer. You have to create that desire. You have to write it down successfully, you know, succinctly in a, in a in a, in a structured fashion, ideally in a Git repository. You specify to the greatest level of detail that you can put all your desire in the Git repository. And then you basically go on vacation, literally. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding, I'm figuratively speaking the word go on vacation because then everything else should be automated. So that you, you're still on vacation and your machine infrastructure, your services delivery, all of that, runs by itself according to whatever you desire. And so you have to specify this thing in a, in a fashion. And so there has to be a system to, to make this desire, first of all, write it down and, in a, and put that in a Git repository and then have to have another system which is going to play that. So this play of the idea, if play is basically like, you know, you play a turntable, or play a cassette recorder, or play a CD, DVD, but that's the kind of C scenario where you're playing the Git repository in, in, a, in effect. And so to play a, a, a Git repository, you need some tool. 
And these tools are what I'm talking about here. The, these examples, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, and all these tools, like I have the links, I'm gonna close out all these windows because they're just examples. And the, the concept is this, where you're going to use those tools that like I described and you play your desire on some service provider, like Azure, Google, and Amazon, any of these, any of the guys in DigitalOcean, you know, some, you, something new comes up tomorrow, all of these. And you play your desire and your outcome will exactly be in line with what you desire. That's desired state configuration. That's what we will be doing. I'm not specifically talking about this Microsoft branded tool, but I'm saying generally all these tools pretty much do the same thing. They have this idea that you specify your desire. You can call it specify your design and the tool will implement it. And here you get your outcome which is basically in line with your desire or in line with your design. That's the outcome we want to accomplish. This outcome is basically what you want to give to your customer. And the implementation is not a one time thing. No, not, not a one time thing, but it's an ongoing thing. So it's not only a one time, but also ongoing. It will maintain that scenario on ongoing. Meaning, you know, you have a desire or a design that you specify, and this thing, this tooling that we will have will not only implement it the first time, but also make it run exactly like your desire or your design. That's the idea. So how do we how do we you know put our head together around in in some real concrete fashion and see you know first of all how do you specify the design how do you play a tool uh, or this this tooling that I mentioned like tons of examples I want to see just one example and I want to run it for real and so I will now uh, run an exercise that you can also do very simple exercise and the the exercise idea is something like this that I will have to have a design and I would like to receive an outcome and I will play some tool. This tool will be a tool called Chef and the design that I would like to have in my mind is I would like some machine, some one machine, just one example to begin with, some machine. Uh, I would like it to become Apache server, Apache web server. That's the desire. It's very simple desire. I have this desire of making that machine convert into a Apache web server. That's my desire. And so I will have to have that desire written down in here. And then this guy will run it and it will create the outcome. This outcome creation will reflect this idea that you know it will basically take this machine and convert into a web server. That's the design implemented. That's what I would like to accomplish. So now uh, the the machine that I will like to use is of course our workstation. This one that we have running right there. This machine right now. Let us see. If I open the terminal and say that, you know what, can you please tell me, are you a web server? Meaning I like to say, you know what, are you running some Apache process? That's one way to check. And also open up the browser and try to go to localhost, for example. Are you a web server? Localhost. Uh, local, type it properly, Nilesh, yes. Localhost. Are you a web server? And apparently it should not be because we have nothing running. So it should fail because it is not a web server. So it should fail uh, momentarily. It is trying to connect to something, but this thing is likely to fail. And so I can 
probably make sure that it fails. So it did. It failed uh, by typing HTTPS or HTTP, and it should fail. Uh, that that's the failure. I was. Um, let me clean up some cookies on this for for uh, for something maybe there for stale. So I want to go to privacy. These clear out all the cookies. Clear it now, and then I will open up, close the browser, open it up again, and see that I have running nothing. Meaning this is not a web server. HTTP colon slash slash local host should show me a failure to connect, which is what I'm looking at right now. And another way to examine that this machine is not a web server is to look for processes by the name Apache. Do I have Apache there? Apparently there is something running, probably because of a previous attempt to run it or some other uh, or some other uh, uh, exercise I may be doing with this machine. So I want to kill all these guys first of all, so that you know we at least get to a common starting point, which tells me that this is uh, not a web server to begin with. Apparently, there are some machines, uh, some containers running. So I want to I want to kill them out completely. So let me clean up that first before I describe this scenarios of change of change of state. The machine, which is not a web server, will become a web server based on our design. So for that, I'm doing some cleanup. Quick cleanup. And it killed. And now let us see if there are any Apache processes running. No, there are none. So I killed everything out, and I have no Apache processes running. And also check the browser again, make sure that I go to localhost, and unable to connect. That's exactly what I wanted to see. So now I can say that the machine state that I have, this machine, is just a machine. It is not a web server, just a plain vanilla machine. That's what I have. So I want to change that. I want to basically incorporate my design. So the original state, the beginning state is like, you know, let's call it the beginning. The beginning state is it's a plain machine. Why is this line so big? Something, oh, marker. Okay. Yeah. So erasing that and using a pen. So initial state is that it is just a machine. And I would like to convert that state from being just a machine to a web server. And that, that change of state, so this is the state, our initial state, state number zero, this is the state, the one I want is state number one. I want to have that transition happen on that machine should become a web server. How do I implement that? Through run or a play of something, so using some tool like this one. And I had to write down my design or my desire. The desire is make this thing, this thing, a web server. That's my desire. So I, I would like to write this down in a desire and say that, you know what, tool, go make it, go make it happen. So this transition will happen. And that's what I intend to do in the exercise. And in our simple scenario, we are going to run this tool called Chef. And it will run directly on the machine right here and convert it itself into this new state from initial state to this new state, which is it becomes a web server. So for that, I would like to run some exercise. It's actually very trivial, but I'm going to go there right now and that one is a good exercise. I want to run that. So let me go do not disturb on this. I think I already do not disturb. So I am going to go run this segment. And I'll paste a link for you so you can also run it. I'll paste that link in Slack chat. So you have it right there. Now in this segment, what I'm going to do is, by the way, please tell me if your audio video display issues, if there are any, please tell me. And so I am going to run this tooling right now as in the machine right here. And you, you know that you know this machine does not have any Apache running. And you know that the local host 
web server is actually not a web server. So you can see that localhost fails to run anything because there is nothing unable to connect because it is not a web server. So with that initial state is clear, now I want to actually run something. So I have a ready-made solution for us. My initial design idea is implemented already in form of a repository that I will give it to you. So this repository, this command, if you run, it will bring down something from GitHub and it already includes the design that I described. It's just to uh, get us started, right? So in that folder, I will clone that repository in which I have this design already implemented and I'll bring it up. Let us see if, if this thing is the initial design that I have. And so I am going to bring that thing down locally and let us see what comes down. It is going to clone from that location. It is bringing it up. And once that thing comes down, we'll be able to use it. Apparently could not resolve that host, which is a sign of an internet problem. It could not resolve. Hmm. Interesting. It should resolve. I think I have a ISP problem, that means. Yeah, the repository exists. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it is not cloning. They're unable to resolve. This means I have to break my internet and change my ISP again. That's what I need to do. This is not resolving. And I, I, I think you understand what I'm going to do is basically may, I'll disappear from the conference for a moment and then I will come back again. If I break the connection for some reason, uh, please hang tight. Yeah, I'm not dropping the call. Or if I somehow accidentally drop the call, I will come back online and the same login information. So we'll do that. Uh, just stand by. I, I will I'll actually change things right now because it is not pulling. This cloning is not happening for me, which is a problem. So uh, I have switched my ISP. Uh, this should uh, bring me back. And now my cloning should work. Let me see if I switch over the ISP completely. So I'm switching and I, my call should continue. I just want to confirm with you that I'm still with you and you're still with me right now. Just confirm that. I changed my ISP though, by the way. Yes, sir, we're here. Oh, good. So yeah, so now this should work. Yeah. Now this, yeah, yeah. yeah, good. So now this cloning should work just fine. Yeah, so that ISP is giving problem with cloning. That's crazy. I don't know why, but you just saw it. So uh, this clone succeeded. Now let us go and examine what that contains. So this, this design contains something uh, to use Chef in a fashion that I described to you already in here. So that's the desire and I want the outcome. This is the outcome that I want. Now to, to get this outcome, we need to run this tool, which we don't have right now in here. This tool is not available. The, the design or the desire has come down, but the tool itself is not installed. So we need to install that tool that I want to use. The tool that we want to run is actually called chef solo and so that's the tool i want to install which i will install in a simple step i think it is gem install chef that should be doing it and so that tool will install uh, chef and should finish off quick uh, maybe not so quick maybe a half a minute more but it should finish and then uh, we should have that tool already loaded and at that time We'll just confirm whether the tool is actually available. And so I'm going to run. Um, is that available in our virtual machine? Yes, yeah, whatever I have is you have, so there's no issues. So uh, exactly what I have is what you have, so there is no problem as such. Uh, you, will, you will run into the same thing that I will run into, except your ISP may be better than mine, apparently. So uh, yeah, so I just installed this line. I'll. I'll basically type it out for you so you will know what I'm doing. I'm installing 
this application, the tool called Chef, which I did using this one line of code. And that line is in Slack chat. So what that tool does is goes to that location in GitHub and grabs the source code. This code is what we wanted. And so this source code, and I, so let me describe a couple of other things here before we, we help you understand what this gem thing is. So gem is actually, think of it as a ready-made package for execution. So we were, we, have, we, have, we were wondering how do we get this tool, so I ran this command called gem install chef. So it, it installed it for us. And now we can use that tool. But a side discussion, what I would like to have is this gem business. What is a gem? So we are using the Ruby language. Ruby language is available in uh, open source uh, from Ruby land or website. And the people, you know, all over the internet will create packages for interesting projects, interesting products. And these packages are wrapped in form of a gem. They are packaged like a gem file. Basically, it's a, it's a, it's a think of it as an executable. That, that's the best way to think of. So you have source code of the package on GitHub. And so you will have a corresponding gem that you can just use because it is ready for use in form of Ruby packaged code. That's a gem. So here, if you go to the browser, and let me go a different browser, and here you will find Ruby Lang. Okay, Ruby language. Uh, that language is available from this location, and that's where you can get the source code, uh, which Ruby's already installed. What you did not have, and I did not have, is the Chef tool itself. And to get that tool, we said we will go to Gem, right? So gems are available in uh, in a site called Ruby Gems, and that site is a host where you can find and install and publish your Ruby Gems if you like. So if you're a developer or if you if you're a contributor, you will publish your gem. If you are a user like we are right now, we can find a gem and install it. So you can search for it. Chef, give me the Chef gem. And there are 7.5 million downloads of this gem called Chef. And so we have it installed right now. How do you install? It is also mentioned right there. Installation step is gem install Chef. That's the instruction. So it's very simple to just grab that command, gem install Chef. It will go to this location called Ruby Gems <coughs> and install it. That's what we just did. We went to this location and said, gem install Chef. So it goes to Ruby Gems. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and downloads that, that ready made package for Chef and makes it available in our location somewhere here. So we are going to use this variation called Chef Solo of the Chef tooling in our machine next. Because this exercise, the example that I'm going to use, is actually a Chef Solo example using Chef Solo, that's the example that I have ready made for us to consume. And so that's what I just did, install Chef, and now I will like to see what I downloaded using the cloning method, which is this thing, using Chef Solo, that exercise was downloaded right now. And so we have it with us, and we want to make use of this exercise. This is the desire, this is my desire written down. So I was talking about desire, which is my desire was to create Oh, sorry, convert this box that I have into a web server box. So this becomes a web server. That's my desire. This is just a box. I want to convert that. And this is written down in that using chef solo folder, which is this folder right there. And I have it on GitHub in open source, so you can see. And in fact, we have downloaded it, cloned it, by cloning the whole thing down. So we can inspect that in Atom Editor and see what it contains. And you will see that there are a bunch of files. And the most important file is this 
the one the one liner that I want to run and execute. This one liner is actually going to execute that thing. But we will first thing first. I want to actually see it in action before we go into the detail about what this thing is, and then then you will you will get to that. First, I want to run it. So first thing first, I will go inside that folder, and now I will have a listing of all the files, and I want to execute this thing. And I can very simply execute that thing by running sudo sh run. That's the execution method. Super user, run it in a shell, that shell script. That's it. So I'm going to copy that line for you and paste it in Slack chat so you have ready access to it. And that's the execution I will run just to get to this design and make it run. So I want to run this like quickly. Apply this for me. So go, chef, do your magic. So convert this. That's what I want to do by running this, this, this one liner I just wrote. That's what I want to accomplish. That one liner you have here. And I will now run that one liner right in that location. So sudo sh run that one line command. And we will do it. It says give me the password. The password, as you know, is already on the wallpaper. Cloud Genius. Type the password and it will start running the chef tool, as you can see. And it is doing its thing, whatever it, that thing is that we defined already. Right? I told you what the idea is to, to make this box into a web server. And it looks like we have succeeded. We have made sure that this box is now, it was unable to connect, but right now it is going to show us a web server. Click, and here we go. We have it, it says it works. And so we have the Apache web server, a default page loading up. Good, that's the web server, ready. So we succeeded in our design. But that's not the, the, the complete story yet. The, the, the real idea behind is not just installing things, that's just one part. But the other idea is to have this tool run it on its own. And most customers, most enterprise customers will run some tools like this on a periodic basis on their entire cloud infrastructure. So this is the cloud. This is the new state of the same cloud. This is the old state and the new state. So uh, let's see, the old state and the new state, the same cloud. And so they, they transition the state and, and this is transition has happened through this chef tooling which runs periodically automatically say in a 30 minutes every 30 minutes run it so you can use the windows at command or you can use the unix uh, cron and these tools are available at the os level so you just use these tools to periodically run the command i just ran and it will automatically run every so often and it's your policy how you decide how frequently you want to run it but that's the tooling it should run by itself and the idea of this is exactly what I'm going to describe is not just installation but maintenance it also maintains the state for you so the second idea is to maintain the state maintain whatever your desire is so if the desire is to convert this old state into a new state meaning make the box a web server that idea, if you run it first time, it will install the things needed to make it a web server. But something might go wrong in the cloud, you know, you know, things go bad. And so the idea of the maintenance action kicks in the next time when it runs periodically, it will run by itself and correct things by itself. Almost like aligning your desire to the outcome. So now that we have seen in this example that it runs manually, so I'm going to simulate this, this repeated runs every so often. I'm going to simulate this by hand by just running it again like this and enter. So I'm just simulating that part just so you know. But if I run it again, nothing will happen because it will have nothing to do. So it will do nothing and come out and say, I did nothing. And that's great because I don't want it to do anything because nothing needs to be done because it's already done what it's supposed to do. 
like convert the box into a web server. It already did that. So if I run it one more time right now, it will gladly do nothing for me and report that it did nothing. It, it said that, you know, I did nothing. And it took me two seconds to do nothing. Good, good, for, good for me and good for them. I mean, you know, it's a tool. It did nothing because I, there was nothing to do. So the other idea that I want to now incorporate is this idea of idempotency. And so I would like to, I like to write that word down in a browser so you don't get my pronunciation in the way. Idempotency. Let's get that thing clearly understood. So the word I'm going to talk about is, where did I type it? Idempotence. Yeah, that's the word I'm talking about. So these operations like I'm talking about are idempotent operations. What does that mean? And that's what I would like to describe next. So the idea of these kind of tools that run here that convert my desire into an outcome, this transition is used through a variety of tools. Like yeah, we are using the chef example right now. All the tools basically operate the same way, the same concept. All these tools are idempotent. Idempotent. What does that mean in mathematics? The word has a specific meaning. It means if you have some thing and you apply some function to it, the, the function is idempotent if repeated actions on the same function over and over will always produce the initial out outcome. You know, so if you keep applying the function over and over again like this, and you will always get the initial outcome that you want. So repeated applications of the function here, 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 and the first time, this is the second application, this is the third application of the function over and over and over again. Uh, you've seen these examples in uh, simple mathematics. Like for example, you have this operation of multiply something by one, and you have some, <clears throat> some number here, say n. <clears throat> multiply this by one, you get, n do it again you get n and do it again you get n the outcome is always your desire outcome equals desire any number of time you keep applying the same thing over and over and over again it is idempotent function another example divide by one anything divide by one Another example would be add zero to it. Or another example, minus subtract zero from it. The outcome is going to be the same. These are trivial examples. Let's go a little bit complex. Let's take this example. You have something and you have a square root of the thing. And then you square it. What's the outcome? X. Is this idempotent function? Yes. Isn't it? They take any number, find a square root, and square it up. You will get x. And you keep doing that over and over, and you will always get this value, x. That's an example of idempotent function. Now let me ask you a question. I'm going to change the idea a little bit. And I'll say, here is a function. Now please tell me if this is idempotent or not. Yes or no. Anybody, it's a trick question by the way. So anybody, <laughs> it's a trick question. Uh, is this idempotent or not? How can it be? Uh -huh. Sorry, I missed that. Both. Uh, yeah, no, it is not an idempotent because, as you said, both, and that makes it not. Because sometimes the answer can be plus x, sometimes the answer can be minus x. So, since there can be two possible answers and not always consistently this answer, that is not true. 
And so the answer is not because it is, as you said, both. And yet you're right. And that's the problem. This is actually not an idempotent function. And you can come up with more examples, but that's mathematics. Let's, let's, let's get back to what we are really trying to accomplish. So these tools that we apply, you know, like we gave examples of, the idea is that it produces an outcome the first time. And if you run the tool again, it also produces the same outcome again and run it again, the same outcome again, same outcome and run it again and like, like that, it goes on. However, however, if something by evil design, you destroy, disturb something here, disturb, and you run this tool again, it will correct it and produce the same outcome again. So any number of times you run the tool, it will automatically produce the outcome that you specify in your desire. And will even if you manually, mechanically go and shake things up, destroy, disturb, things like that, it will automatically correct that. And so let's go do that experiment. So here, in our machine, we have the web server running. You see that, you see that. I'm going to destroy it. So here we have web server running and functional. I'm going to kill the guy. I mean, literally, deliberately kill the guy like this. Uh, what's the number here? 6147. So that's how I kill. And now I have two more left. I'll kill both of them. And those are 6150 and 6151. Yeah. So killed everything. Now I have nothing left called Apache. So I deliberately killed these guys by running commands like this sudo kill dash nine to kill the processes running. Now if I go to the browser and try to refresh, unable to connect. Expected. Totally expected. Yes, I did. Now comes this this idea of idempotence. Now your tool will is supposed to run automatically every 30 minutes, for example. And so I'm going to simulate that automation by hand for right now, and I will run the tool manually, right? So here we go. I'm going to run the tool manually by running that same thing again, same operation, off we go. It will find that something is broken and fix it. And say, yeah, I did. And so we can now go back to the browser and refresh, and it is working. You can go even more destructive. This killing of running process was not enough. We can go even further destructive. Like for example, that, that Apache application that we have, it is running, we know it is right now running and we can see it because it came back to life even though I killed it and chef came along and fixed it. And so if I run that chef again, it will do nothing because it's already according to what we desire. And so that nothing is clear. And it did that nothing in one second. And that's good because our, sh our things are running all just fine and our browser looks to be functional and that's nice, but I am not satisfied. I want to go even further destructive than just killing a process. For example, I want to actually uninstall Apache like, completely. So sudo app get remove Apache and say, yeah, get rid of it. What do you mean not, not installed? It is Apache, oh, it's Apache 2. Yeah, so it's going to uninstall Apache and it tells me that, you know, there are some other things uh, that need to be removed also if you really want this to go away. So I need to run this command to remove the unneeded packages. The following packages were automatically installed and are no longer required. So all these guys, Apache binary, Apache data, blah, 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 all these guys need to also go away. I can remove them by running this command, which I will. I'll gladly get rid of all of that. So apt, get, auto, remove all the dependencies that are not needed anymore, and purge them from my system. And it removed everything. Nice. Now let us see, do we have Apache running? No, we don't. Okay, uh, let's confirm here. 
Is that Apache work? No, unable to connect. Nice. We did good destructor, good destruction, right? So completely uninstalled the whole thing. Now let us have Chef run again one more time, like this. It will correct this situation one more time. Basically, if it doesn't find Apache, it will go to the Ubuntu sources, install Apache, run it, and bring everything back to life just like we are expecting it to be running Apache right now, like this. And go to the browser, refresh, and there we see it again. So what are we doing, essentially? What are we doing is, in our design, we define our desire. We have the tooling run every so often, say 30 minutes. I was manually simulating this. And in its first occurrence, it implemented our design. So the machine that was there, it transitioned the state from nothing to yes, a web server. It did that. And then I went manually, mechanically, you know, killing this guy. And then it ran it again and it fixed it. Then I said, you know what, killing process is not enough. I'm going to uninstall, remove the packages. And then this chef came along and it, it, it fixed it. And so you basically see a scenario where chef is smart, it understands your desire, and it not only sets up whatever you want, but also maintains your desire. So your desire for converting this basic bare bones thing into a something useful was the desire. And it successfully, it successfully not only set up, but it is going to maintain that desire for you in your cloud so you can go on vacation. That's the core idea, you know, the core, the core summary of what this tooling does. Now, any questions on this idea before we go deeper? Because we will go a ton more deeper. This is just a you know, beginning. We, we just started. We just started using these tools. So uh, the core concept essentially is like that, like I described. Desire or call it design and outcome. And we'll begin with, you know, raw infrastructure as a service, like basic, whatever we get, raw machines and get the outcome running and maintain the outcome. Not only get the outcome, but maintain that outcome. Maintain the outcome, leave it running, keep it running on raw cloud. You know, just whatever you get from Amazon, Microsoft, raw. The raw deal you get, like get a machine. Okay, you got machine, now what? From that point to the outcome that you desire or you define, these tools will help you accomplish and maintain your desire, your design. That's what we are really going deeper with, a variety of tools that you will see. And so questions at this moment are great. Anybody? Nobody? Makes sense. Okay, good. That, that, that's good to know. So, our yeah. concept was clear, right? Did you? Did anybody try this on your side yourself? Yeah, I'm trying to actually go. Okay, so uh, if you need help, let me know. Yeah, it seems my ISP no connect day in the virtual machine, so. Aha, aha. So that ISP not connecting was probably because of this thing. I know what's going on. Why that ISP did not connect for me either was because of this thing, which I'm going to show you. It comes from the fact that your machine settings, the network settings, need to be reattached. So this NAT that you have, it doesn't get an IP address from there. That's the reason why it doesn't go out. And I will like to validate this approach by connecting a different network right now. That's what's going on essentially. That, that's the reason why it did not work when the transition happened. So now I have temporarily hooked up another, another internet company, which is a phone. And so that, that iPhone is now hooked up here. And now I'm going to disable this connection. And when I do that, 
I might accidentally kick you out. And so if that happens, I'll come back online, but don't worry. I'm breaking this second network, which is a cable connection. I will remove that connection and I hope the call does not drop. I just hope. So with that understood, I will now go and remove that cable. And let's see whether I can prove the hypothesis. So I just successfully yanked that cable out. Now I think I'm still connected, but I am going to rely on you to confirm that I'm still connected. Yeah, we're here. You are. Good. So now you can see that this iPhone is connected, but Ethernet is not, which is basically I removed the cable. Now let's validate the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that this, this uh, Git clone, or rather even simple ping will not work. Because the machine has no idea how to get to the internet. This machine does. Uh, so you can go to Yahoo. I mean, nobody goes to Yahoo, but say MSN. So should I have network access then in the virtual machine? Yes, you should. The only thing that is needed in the VM is, is this. You have to basically uh, sudo service networking restart. Oh, it failed. Job is already running. I ran restart job. Uh, so I, I think I need to restart the networking. A simple way, a simple workaround is to just reboot the VM. So you shut down and restart. That should fix it. That should bring internet connection and also have your uh, uh, Git clones and everything should work. I mean, ISPs would not drop, you know, particular websites from working. It should not drop, but that was the issue. I think that was going on the last time when I ran into this cloning, not able to clone issue is because this machine did not know or have a route to the internet. Now, if I ping Yahoo, it should work. And it did. Now, let us see if you go to that location and remove that using Chef Solo thing and okay, sudo. RMRFRF using Chef Solo, go away. And then I will clone again one more time. And this cloning will be basically that command, one long command from here. And this would work. I'm betting money, it will work. And it did. Okay. And so I'm back in that location uh, and all these things, the command I ran, all these things are available because this particular machine did not have a route to the internet. That was the issue uh, the last time when I ran. So to, to clarify, okay, hold on, this, this connection, no, not this. I should say this connection. This connection did not have a route to the internet. That's why it was not working the last time I tried. When I reboot the VM, it worked. And you, if you're running into the same problem, you should reboot the VM. Yep, that worked. Okay, cool. So uh, it just uh, how you, how you get a route to the internet. The design in our case of a VM uh, is like this: that your VM is actually behind a router provided to you by the software called VirtualBox. And you may have your computer, the computer which is a PC or a Mac connected to your ISP, which may have another router actually in your home or office. And then this ISP comes after that, not before. So I should erase that design. And your scenario is probably where you have this machine that you have this is your PC or Mac or Linux. I don't know what you have, uh, but those things, the box that you're using is connected to your router, which is a physical router. And this router is virtual. And this physical router is connected to your ISP. So, so do you have to, to physically read the, what was that, the restart the VM, not the virtual box again? You don't have to restart, actually. You can just restart the network. You can remove this cable, this virtual cable that you have between your virtual router and virtual machine. 
Mm-hmm. To break this cable and reconnect, that should do it. I tried to do that. I did not quickly do it, so I, I did not waste time. Otherwise, this cable you, are, you can break it and reestablish. That should work. You can break and reestablish that connection somewhere here. So you can go to your VM machine settings and say network, and you know what? Not attached. And say okay, and then do the same thing again. Settings and network, and say attached. And say okay. That's how you remove the cable by hand and connect it. So that's the virtual cable between the VM and the virtual router inside virtual box is disconnected, reconnected. And when you do that, you should get a new IP address like this one and route to the internet. So you can say trace route yahoo.com. It should actually oh, there's no trace route installed, but you can install those tools uh, by running this command and get trace route to install and you can trace trace the route. So it will show you the routing from how the routing broke. So that, that was what was going on when I first failed on accessing GitHub. VM. Okay. So enough of that uh, routing uh, discussion. Let back on this tooling discussion, which is what we want to be able to do in this exercise, which you did, your first chef run. As that you finally you know killed a bunch of times and then ran it again and killed it again and, and uninstalled it. But that I would like to change my design a little bit. My desire I have, which is this desire that I have, which is a hey, make it a web server. So the, the original raw machine that I have, make it a web server. Uh, that desire I want to change now. I want to say that you know this web server shows me a bland Apache page. Uh, that's not interesting. I would like to put my page there. So you have to specify this my page. I want to put my page in that machine in the raw machine all the way. So I have to change my design. My desire has to change, and then this chef tooling or any other tooling will pick it up and run. So this desire change you have to specify, and that is what is given in this segment. It says, you know, modify the cookbook, that segment. And I'll tell you what cookbook is and all these things just a minute. So we will we'll go to have that discussion, but that, that modification is what is needed to differently state the design so that it actually does something different. And that's what I would like to talk about, but I haven't actually described to you what Chef is and how this thing runs and all that. So I'll, I'll just take a brief moment to do that and then come back and do this exercise, which is the Chef run. So right now, in our machine here, we should have a uh, web browser open and localhost showing all that good stuff. That is a default Ubuntu page. That's not what I want to see. I want to see my page there, my output, my outcome, my desire should show up in the web server. That's what I would like to have. So that's that needs some discussion on what this tool is and how it behaves and all that specifics. So let's do that. Let's do that. <clears throat> so this tool that we are talking about is called Chef. And uh, it is started by a group of people in Seattle area. The company is now known as Chef.io. The entire product is open source. That's what we just used. We used that source code from Chef on GitHub. And somebody has created a gem bundle. So we used that gem package, installed it on our machine. And then that's how we are using the open source Chef. This company also provides services, commercial services uh, that some companies use, and it's a beautiful service. But let, let's stay focused on the open source aspects, not the commercial aspects. That's not what we're discussing right now. So skip that. But I just want you to know that this the company is local to Seattle area, and uh, it's, it's a good product. Having said, stick to open source. So the same people who create that product called Chef right here on this location. Where is that location? Here on GitHub. So let's go there and find out what do we have. So in that location, we have a tool called Chef, a company called Chef, 
and in this github location you will find there are not only this one uh, product but there are a bunch of other things i mean it goes on and on if you look at this product this particular one has uh, uh, a change happened 7 hours ago like it's very active the community is very active there are 17625 commits uh, there are 482 contributors and lots of people making use of so that's what this pretty pretty decent tool is doing for us and uh, this tooling comes in a couple of different forms the one that i would like to talk about operates in succinctly two different fashions so one of them is it's called the solo mode of operation the other one that we will use eventually is a client server mode of operation so those two modes of operation are available now when it operates like this client and server uh the idea is uh they don't use the word client or or actually they they use the word chef client but it's more used as a the name that they use is called chef client and not to confuse anybody with the nomenclature of use of the word server the specific name that the product uses is called chef server just to avoid any confusion these are the two names that are used when people are talking about client and server in the context of chef similarly this tool runs stand alone like we ran today and the name of that tool is called chef solo like you saw you saw this binary actually has this reference so that's the binary that we ran right now this binary gets installed when you install chef using a gem like we did gem install chef so the point here is this operates by itself and these things operate in combination with each other so there is a chef client binary and a chef server binary this is a binary another binary a binary is like exe for example in windows so uh that's what these two things will operate together and by the way chef is also available on windows and works just fine azure supports uh, chef first class citizen there is a good partnership uh, with microsoft and chef so that is actually a very good product even for windows users just so you know and so this this binary that you have here binary is what we just ran now the usage scenarios the scenario of usage is that chef has to run to do something that's very simple very intuitive so you have a machine and that's the machine typically sitting in the cloud it can by the way sit in your garage it doesn't matter it can also be your laptop if you like to manage your laptop using chef you can totally do that or you can most most use cases are machines in the cloud gets managed using these tools so where that machine actually sits whether your garage or your laptop or whatever that's irrelevant it's really irrelevant it's about maintaining and managing the state of a machine that's what we want to accomplish manage its state that's the outcome we want to accomplish so to manage the state of that machine we want to run some binary now we can run it in two fashions the solo fashion or the client server fashion so let's first talk about the solo fashion for the binary to run the binary has to run on this box and then it will do its thing and then that's how it operates so somehow you have to make sure that this binary gets executed here in our example we just did we had the binary local we were sitting on the machine like right there this is the cloud genius workstation we were right on the machine itself and we installed chef right here and then ran the solo binary and it ran on the workstation itself and that is how we did but let me tell you this is not how most people run this is exactly not how most mainstream usage does not go like this 
although there are big large companies that actually use it like this so the, there is a company example called joyent which is a big cloud company these days acquired by samsung i think or maybe will be acquired by samsung or something like that but this is a large cloud company uh, they have a free trial if you want to try them out it's a very good uh, product they give you 250 dollars for example and so you have enough money to try and actually make use of they also support docker by the way and so most of these people from joint are actually employees of solaris uh, sun microsystems uh, that's where they come from so the the solaris os is the foundation of joint cloud it has a new name these days called uh, forgetting its new name but the original uh, code i think i think it is uh, I'll get to the name if I remember it. I'll, I'll find out and tell you. But the origin is Sun. So that cloud, uh, the joint cloud uh, director of operations uses, and he's on record on YouTube video, and he says that he uses Chef Solo to manage joint cloud. There's a, there's a video of him saying that. And I'll point that out to you. At, uh, maybe there's a link here somewhere in the website that we'll, we'll, you will run into when you read this. There's probably a link somewhere written down. So yes, people. I'm getting a can't find file when I run the pseudo one. Uh, can you tell me what command you and where are you running? Yeah, I'm doing. Uh, I'm following along on the website. You know, steps. Okay, can you tell me which step? Yeah, it's the pseudo run the run, run chef in solo mode. So hold on, it's the run dash chef dash solo dot sh that command. Probably there is a step missing to uh, cd into the directory. Yeah, let me just see your machine. So why don't you share your desktop? There must be a missing or something. Possibly, very likely. So uh, let's go see your desktop, see what's going on. So share your desktop, please. Yep, hold on. And so go to the VM. Yeah, here's the VM. Yep. So here you have to... Yeah, you're not in the directory. Not in the folder. Oh. Yeah, you go to CD, capital U, tab. Tilde? Tab, tab. tab. Oh, yeah, okay. cool. So tab completion is... Oh, gotcha. Okay, interesting. And then run it from here. Yes, so now you should find it. Uh, you installed uh, Gem, Gem install solo, right? Yes. Oh, good. So uh, yeah, you should, it should run uh, that command. Yes, it should, it should run. If you have Chef installed, uh, you, do, you get the run the script. That line is better. The sudo sh run Chef solo, much better. Sudo sh, no, no, not like this. No. Sudo sh. Sorry, hold on. Space sh. Space and then the file name. Which would be what? Chef? Just type. Uh, just type R and hit tab. Tab. Yeah. Oh, you have to sudo everything before. Okay. No, chef needs sudo. Not not everything, but just chef needs sudo. Gotcha. It's uh, similar to how Windows expects you to right click and run as administrator. Uh, even though you are logged in as administrator, sometimes it asks you to. I see. The elevation of privileges uh, for Windows people. And the password then? Is written down on your screen. Cloud genius. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, that's a, such a frequently asked question that I. You, you, never, you never assume, that's for sure. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured, okay. I All should right. be caught up now, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that is cool. That is cool. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay, now sharing my screen. <clears throat> so, uh, what was I discussing? I've completely forgot. Let me yes, go back. Uh, on the whiteboard. Yeah. So, yeah, Chef Solo. So, this guy, his name is, I remember his name, Joint Cloud. Ben Rockwood. Chef Solo, that's his name. And so he's the director of cloud operations and the name of the Solaris, uh, the new uh, open source implementation is called SmartOS. 
And so he uses, he's on YouTube. So maybe we should find him on YouTube. And here, I think this is the video where he is on <laughs> yeah, I think I found the exact spot in the video where he is showing you. It runs beautifully on uh, all the most based systems. Yeah, I think somewhere along 15 minute mark, uh, that's where he is. Uh, he's using Chef Solo right here. So that's the mark that you would like to grab and maybe watch, take a look at this uh, video. I will paste that link out in Slack chat. So Slack chat, come on. And so you should watch this mark. You will see that this gentleman is using, at least he used to use at that point in time, used Chef Solo. And so that's the usage scenario of using Chef in its solo mode where you run the binary directly without having to have a separate method of remotely controlling it. That's one usage scenario. The second usage scenario is probably more common. And in that scenario, uh, the, the work, work like this, something like this. You still have to run that chef client on the machines in the cloud. You still have to execute this binary on the machine that sits in the cloud. You still have to do that. But the binary that you run is slightly different. It is the chef client binary as opposed to chef solo binary. The different binary, very, very similar in its function, except one thing is that this thing requires a connection to the chef server, which is another machine that you will have running this binary. So it's a separate box, typically like one box per project that you will maintain in your company that dedicates itself to being the chef server. And this is where your desire is maintained. So you put your desires here and then you say, yeah, go do it. And then chef client will execute on your cloud. This is just one machine right now, but you can have thousands and hundreds of thousands and all that. They will all run <clears throat> this binary, which will interact with the chef server to seek your desire. And get the desire and implement it. And maintain it. And this will run on its own every so often, according to what you may choose, your policy for your company. And so those machines you will have will run that chef client binary every so often on a act command or a cron job like that. Periodically, repeatedly run is one way of implementing. It will then implement your desire, maintain your desire, according to what you specify in here. And whatever you specify in here is typically collectively called a kitchen, which will contain a bunch of kitchen things like cookbooks, for example. And so in the chef product, you have a cookbook. In Ansible product, you have a playbook. In the Microsoft product called Desired State Configuration, you have a thing called a runbook. And in uh, Puppet, you have a thing called Manifest. So it's a variety of names of the same concept. Ansible, DSC, Puppet, this, you come up with a name. Essentially what you're doing is defining what you desire. And these tools will do exactly what you define. They're slightly different from each other, but more or less this do the same thing. The same concept. Concept is to implement and maintain your desire. So you define your desire, put that in a chef server, which is typically one box running this binary. And then your cloud. 
you have machines here m1 m2 m3 like that thousands of hundreds of thousands each one of them executing chef client that basically interfaces back here okay what is your desire did your desire change oh let me then take that change and incorporate and implement that change across your cloud you might change your desire you know this guy who is the uber boss and you know you can change your desire i say you know what now here is a new design my new desire is take this and keep it in the chef server so these these clients you will run here 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 they will go and get the new desire down and implement across your cloud that's the user scenario from a client so i should say chef client chef server perspective i should not use the word client server because it can confuse because most people will think these are servers they are cloud servers and you are correct they are they are your cloud servers they are serving your customer the customers are accessing these services that you provide totally right absolutely and that therefore i should not use the word server when i'm talking about chef server because it's a different box typically one box server for a given project maybe more than one for a very large project or multiple boxes in a company things like that so these boxes are dedicated to that role it's a dedicated box its function is to ma manage your desires whatever you desire and all the changes and all that so you you basically send your desire and these runs will implement your desire that's the idea now in our example we just ran we have to have a method which we we don't have is a chef server right now so but we do not have is a chef server in our implementation is using chef solo in the first example that we ran it's, therefore we don't have this but we still have to have a place to store our desire and that place is the folder that we are using called using chef solo that's where we have kept our desire in here and we want to change the desire now change and we will do that change right now we have to do that right in the folder itself because we don't have this thing in the first, very first example don't have it because we are using solo it doesn't need it doesn't have it but let me tell you this product is equally capable as the other product they're basically the same except this guy will look for a folder right on the machine itself where it is running for the desire whereas the other guy which is this these these green items that i'm looking at these are chef client binary executions happening across your cloud machines they need to go to the chef server and then get your desire or maybe updated your desire your updated desire down and then implement according to what you desire and that's how your cloud infrastructure will update according to your desire and you will deliver new value to the customer so you put your desires here and they will flow to the machines and that's how you service your customer that's the design in the, in a larger context we just began using it so that's why we have it simple don't have the chef server don't need it right now use solo put everything you want in a folder make the folder locally available and run it you want to change something go change the folder and run it you want to change something again more changes and run it by the way this runs operate operate automatically most of the time you can automate these runs but we will keep simulating them by hand we'll keep doing them by hand so we are, we are learning as we learn and that's what we want to be able to accomplish is make a change in the folder itself 
But before we change it, we need to understand what it contains. So that's what we'll do next. So in that folder we have, which is in this location, we have that folder sitting right there. And it came from a Git repository that I have created for you already. So we'll open that folder in a editor. And let us see what we got. So the editor is opening up. And we have this one command we ran. This one liner we ran was, we ran it like this, sudo sh, like this. And by the way, the fact that there is sudo right there already in the command itself is another way to not really have to have sudo at the beginning of sh you can actually go without sh uh, without sudo without sudo just say using or rather run and that should do it because there is sudo already in there so there is no need for an extra sudo it doesn't it's not required that's what i'm saying so there is no need for a double sudo doesn't hurt but this will also ask for password because the sudo is built in so i will give that password to it and it will do nothing. It will gladly do that nothing for us, and it finishes. And it did. I mean, it gladly, gladly did nothing right there in three seconds. Great. But what is it? That is, what is it doing exactly? So let's go understand. The command was to run this thing. What is that thing? If you go split here. It is pointing to some binary here. In that location is a binary sitting. The binary is called Chef Solo. How did it come here? We installed Chef through a gem package that loads it up in that location. So home user dot rbenb shims. That's the location where your gems get installed in the Cloud Genius Workstation. It depends on your package manager where it will get installed like in in uh, in windows you will have the program files location in macintosh you have the, the finder applications location and so these are defined by the operating system vendor in linux you define you know and so i have chosen that i put them in this location that's my choice and so uh, it is a choice for a specific reason. Uh, it is the way that I have built the machine that that's where it gets stored. If it is a Ruby gem package, that's where it will go. And so that's the location of the package. The binary is called Chef Solo. This is the name of the binary. And it takes two arguments. Here is one. And the other one is the dash j option. Now there are two arguments it accepts, it receives. Let us go read those two one at a time. So there is an argument called dash c solo.rb. This argument is one of them. And the other one is dna.json. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, read them one at a time. First one is solo.rb. This, what does it say? There has to be a file by that name somewhere. And apparently it is right here, solo rb, that file. And so let's go read that. It is two lines of Ruby code, not complex. It is actually pretty darn simple if you carefully read it. It says cookbook path. And it says the cookbook path is the folder called cookbooks. That's where I'm storing my cookbooks, is the folder called cookbooks which is by the way, this folder, the cookbook folder. That's where I'm storing my folder. And if I want to store my cookbooks in some other location, like whatever location, then I need to rename this to whatever. And so if I rename this folder to whatever, in that case, I need to also go to solo rb and tell chef that I am storing my cookbooks. My cookbook path is whatever. And that's fine. This will work. Similarly, 
I'm saying that my JSON attributes for chef to run properly are defined in a file by that name. And that happens to be another file name which sits in right there, by the way, this one. That's the file. So the idea behind this is that you can put that JSON attributes that chef expects in any location like you like here, any, as long as you are storing these things in the appropriate file name and referring them accordingly in your solo RB. Jason again, sorry. Jason is a JavaScript object notation. It is basically a systematic method of writing JavaScript based objects. So it describes how and what it includes. What do you want to talk? It's the way to, it's like XML. So if you know XML in, in, uh, in Microsoft, it's oh, awesome. okay. Got it. exchange information. Uh, this is also used by Microsoft, by the way. It is called JavaScript object notation. And I think it is better. It is succinct and shorter in description. In XML, you have a lot more. So it largely replacing XML, which is used by Ajax. It is the most common data format used for asynchronous browser server communication and it is largely replacing XML. That's what JSON is. It is independent of machines, independent of operating systems, but it originates from JavaScript. Therefore, the name JavaScript object notation, but it is just a notation. It's a way of writing things. It is <coughs> what you will see in the example here. So that JSON, is basically a way of writing things. I, I, as long as you have this file reference pointing to the correct file, which contains whatever you want to describe, and we'll go read that also. But all these names that I'm writing and modifying, like whatever or any, even this name solo is not succinct. You know, not there's no sanctity around that name. You can modify this to be uh, duo if you like. It doesn't have to be solo, but if you modify it like duo, uh, I did not rename, so let me rename that, rename to duo.rb, and I just renamed that file to duo. In that case, my command needs to change and say duo. And this command needs to become any. So you, you're seeing what I'm doing essentially is, <clears throat> I have basically modified the whole project by telling you that this is the binary that I'm executing called Chef Soro. It expects some argument about where the default file locations are in a Ruby, a Ruby description, like this RB file, which basically is the RB file I have here, duo.rb, which basically says my cookbooks are located in a folder called whatever, and my JSON attributes are located in a file called any.json, and that's my duo.rb, I just renamed it. And that's this reference here. Now the second reference, this any.json. So this any that I have here, it contains specific instructions of what should that binary do. And this is it. This is the place where you define what you want to do and what's the outcome. So the definition is, Again, two lines. Define a temporary location. That's the TMP location. And after you define that, you run something. And here is a list of things you want to run. One of them, or the only one, is to invoke the main, sorry, the default recipe in the main cookbook. Again, this way to read that is, the default recipe in the main cookbook. So there has to be a cookbook called main. And there should be a default recipe, which I want to run as my run list. And so if you go look at my cookbooks, where are my cookbooks stored? Again, they are stored somewhere in 
a location called whatever. So I need to go to look at the whatever folder and there has to be a book called where is my JSON here? It can be confusing since I randomized the names, but just remember that there is a main cookbook and here is the main cookbook in which there are recipes and there is only one recipe in there which is called the default recipe. So let's go and read it. So the default recipe says, yeah, do these things. So here, the first action is the install action. It does not describe how, it describes what. It doesn't say how to install. It says, do it, install. Apache, that's what it says. It doesn't describe how exactly to install Apache. Depending on the operating system, it can be Ubuntu, CentOS, Fedora, uh, or Windows. They all will do whatever it takes to make it happen. They all will accomplish the same outcome. And we don't have to worry about defining what these things are. So if you run this on a Windows box, it will install Apache server on Windows. And how to do it? We don't have to worry about it. Because Chef knows. And the idea is it is a well-known thing. Why do we have to worry? We need to define the outcome. What do we desire? We desire that Apache should be installed. Big deal. Yeah, Chef will do it. You don't have to worry about how it does. But it will do it. So don't worry. Just tell us what you want and Chef will do it. The next action is two parts. Start it and enable it. So activate it basically. Make it alive. Not only start the process, but enable it. The two part actions for Apache. And that is the description that I have in a default recipe in the main cookbook. By the way, this is the cookbook that I wrote, this one, very small. And I am using another cookbook. That cookbook is called Apache 2. And I did not write that. Somebody else did. There's a large community of people that write these cookbooks and are made available to us in a location called the supermarket. And so if you go to the supermarket, you will find cookbooks right here. And so you can say Apache and you will find a cookbook for Apache. And it is right this one. It was updated last on 14th of April. And here's the source code for it. It was created by this gentleman, Van, uh, Sander Van Zoost. And that is his bunch of cookbooks. It was created about seven years ago. He'd been, he'd been busy. And so uh, Chef is, I think, seven years ago, she had seven year old product. He's one of the initial ones. So this is the source code for it. It's on GitHub uh, by this gentleman. And that is also a very popular repository, which is the Apache cookbook for chef. It is available from the supermarket. So all these chef names are all related to kitchen and cooking. And so that's where this thing comes from. And that is exactly where I obtained that cookbook from. And it is open source, so you can just put it. So I dropped the cookbook right there. And it's a huge cookbook. My cookbook called Main is very small. The other cookbook is large. You can see a lot more detail there and we'll go into detail about that, but really not necessary for using Chef. Unless you're developing and extending Chef, yes, in that case you will. And by the way, we will create cookbooks ourselves uh, at, at, at maybe three to four sessions down the road, we will create them. For right now, just realize that this cookbook is a cookbook available to us from the community, which are, you can go to the supermarket and obtain from there. In our example, we are just using that cookbook and we are invoking that through the main cookbook default recipe like this. Since I have modified a bunch of names, I need to make sure that it, I did it correctly. I think I did it correctly, all the whatever and any or do and all that. I just want to test run it. I think it is all okay. And so I want to just quickly test run the whole thing, make sure that it still works the way I want. And so I'll just run Chef Solo. 
and it should just work. And if it doesn't, then I made a mistake in find renaming these things. And I think I did not make a mistake. However, these names that I have chosen randomly can be confusing. So I want to go back to the way it was. So I can just very quickly go with it reset hard and reset. And so now I have cleaned up. I will also get rid of this whatever and this any and this duo and the no local mode cache. It's a cache, you can delete it. And it's active apparently. And the nodes folder, you can also delete that one. And it's all gone, gone. Apparently it is still active. So I need to close out this window and clean up on aisle nine. I think, yeah. We need to go kill. I think it is occupied. So I, I can leave this thing running, but this is exactly how we obtained our original source, which means we should be able to run it one more time to validate. And I'm going to run that thing, uh, uh, run that uh, command one more time. And it should just run chef by doing nothing. And yeah, it did nothing. Great. So then now let's read that again. Now the, the, the form it came in from without using my renaming modifications. So in my renames, I have modified a bunch of things. I got rid of all of that. These green items are created the runtime operations. So there's a node reference created for the machine itself that you can read. It is the machine referring to this Linux box where it is running right now. And uh, it, it's dynamically generated. So green items are created on the runtime. So you can ignore these two items. They came after we ran it first time. However, in our cookbook, collection is stored in that folder. It is defined in this file called solo RB by the name cookbook. And the DNA information is stored in this DNA. Now let me give you a biologically wrong analogy. So there is an analogy that I like to give because it works. It is actually wrong. This is not how biology works. But I just want to say that this is biologically incorrect. It is wrong. Having, having said that, the analogy that I like to use is like this. So imagine if you have a embryo. And you have a magical method of injecting a DNA. And so if you inject a DNA, it becomes that animal. So if you say inject a giraffe DNA, it will grow up this embryo to become a full size giraffe. If you then take that, you know what, I want to make it a lion. So I want to, I, I want to inject lion DNA here and it will create a lion for me. And you know, if I want to inject a human DNA, into the embryo, it creates a human. And again, this is all biologically wrong, just so you know. It doesn't work like that, but I'm just saying that the idea that we have is that you define your DNA, is your desire. And that's where this DNA JSON comes from, is you define your desire and you inject that into a machine and that will take shape of your outcome that you want. And so that's what we are really trying to inject is this desire that you define in the DNA JSON. So that DNA JSON that you have here is that file, which is this one is where we are defining our desire. Our desire is to make sure that you run the default recipe in the main cookbook, which happens to be this one. And that specific default recipe says, I would like Apache to be in the state install. If it is not there, go and install it, please. If it is there, do nothing. Next, I would like my Apache to be started. And if it is not started, please start it. I would also like my Apache server to be enabled. 
so that my browser, when it sees something, it wants to go and see the browser page uh, from the local host machine, it should actually show you this page. And that default page should show. And whatever you want is the default will show up because you haven't actually described the level of detail that is needed to make something different from the default. If you're just simply enabling it, what you will see is the default state. Having said, we want to now actually make a little bit of change in our cookbook. What we want to be able to do is to modify the main cookbook to customize what users would see in their browser. And we want to make that modification. We can accomplish that by making a little bit of change in the recipe, in the DNA, uh, the exact detail about what do we want as the outcome. And we'd like to make those changes in the cookbook itself, which is that default recipe file in the main cookbook. The default recipe in the main cookbook. That's where I want to make a change and I want to add this segment to it. This segment here. Let's go take it and take that segment and go in here and add it and save. And so we added a new action. The action is drop in a file in that location. That's where Apache serves from, by the way. So if you go to that location inside here in the machine, and say, you know what, please go to that location. Oh, sorry, 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 I typed wrong. Please go to that location. And in that location, there is this file called index.html, that file. I want to replace that file with something that I would like to be taking over. So get rid of that one and put my thing there. That's what will happen if you want to get rid of this page. So if you have, if you've seen this page yourself on the web server right here, and you want to modify it, you would like to modify that file. That's how it, that's how it actually works. So if you want to do manually, you'll actually edit that file right there. And in that file, you will go down and change the header somewhere. Let's go make a modification somewhere in the header. And so, it says it works. So I'll get, make a change that it works and it says it sucks. I just made that change. I'm going to save it. I did it manually. So like this word, it works, will become it sucks. And there it did. And so, yeah, this default page sucks. I don't want it. So I want to get rid of that page, but I don't want to do it manually. I did it manually this time because just to illustrate the point that it sucks, default page. I want my page there. So to accomplish that, I want to replace that file with a custom file that I would like to provide you in form of a source. So here to take my file, go put it in the right location. And so put that in that location, take this file. Now that file has to be made available to Chef. And that file needs to go in the main cookbook somewhere in here. So we'll create that right now. We'll first of all, save this change that I added here, and then go here. And understand that we need to create a index.html file ourselves, which means we need to have something in that file. So we can create that file index.html in your cookbook, main cookbook, inside that location. So we have to go there and then create a file and then basically get to the editor, but we can get straight to the editor. These are instructions are a little bit older before Atom editor came along. So I still have the older method of getting to the file. Uh, since we have this new fantastic, beautiful Atom editor, we don't need to go through this terminal command line uh, business. It still works by the way. But we are using a different editor here, gedit editor, but Atom is beautiful. 
uh, you can just manually create whatever, visually create whatever you want. So you want to create that folder, MKDIR. You want to create a folder called cookbooks and then main and then files and then default. That's what I would like to see like this. You can do it mechanically using a terminal like this step, these steps defined here, or you can create that folder like this under main files default. You can do it through Atom, which you can. And be very careful in using Atom. You have to go main, right click a new folder and call it files. And then inside files, you have to right click one more time and create a new folder called default. And don't make a typing mistake. Because if you do, there'll be a problem. So you have to have a default files folder created. So main files and default. That's what we now have, main files and default. In that default folder, we need to create a new file. A new file is basically by pressing Control N and then saving it. We want to save this file in that cookbooks main files default. So cookbook main files default location. In that file, I want to save a file called index.html. So cookbook main file default that location will save this new file that I want to place it right there. That's where I would like to have my content goes here. That's where it should go. And so that's what I would like to have provided to this chef run. When it runs, it should pick up that file, put it in the right location. My content goes here. So in that content, we'll put some realistic content, like for example, this. So we'll take that sample and drop it in like this and then save and then close the window and close this window also because now it will do exactly what we told is that take my source and drop it in that location please and good so we have that structure now we have an index html file we want to provide and we say you know take my file and please put in the right location. Thank you. And it will do that. So we'll run Chef again, just like that. You can go up arrow anytime in Linux and find a previous command. You keep going up, up, up until you find, and then you hit enter. It cannot find because we are in the wrong location. We are not in the right folder. So we need to go back to that location by typing this, and then run. When we run it this time, it has a one more extra thing to do. So you can see that the number of things to do was increased by one. It used to be three things to do, now it is four things to do. And it told us that, you know, I did all the things that are needed. I, I needed to do only one thing out of four, and I did that for you, sir. So chef client comes back and says, you know, I did one out of four things that you wanted me to do, and now you should go check it out. So we should go to the browser and just refresh and you see chef really works that's what you're looking at and so this is working because that's what it's supposed to be doing it's going to grab that thing as you said here and this is the fourth item to do so this is a source action so take this source item place in the file using cookbook so that file that we have provided called index.html that sits in the main files default location will be taken over from this location and dropped in place of that file, which is exactly what we did when it, when it works. I modified it to it sucks uh, by hand, and now it has been completely replaced with this. And you keep running Chef over and over again. It runs by itself in how you implement the scenario. And it did nothing. Because the four things to do were to install Apache. Yeah, already up to date. To start Apache, already started. To enable Apache, already up to date. And to create this file, it already is there. So it created, nothing to do. Zero. I did nothing in two seconds. Awesome. 
Now what if I want to change it? Change this back again and you'll see Chef really works. I want to modify this one, say. Uh, maybe make something here. Sorry, quick bio break. Yeah, yeah, bio break is great. So I said, yeah, right, save it, close it, run it, and off we go for a bio break. So I just ran it again. You will see that it will modify, and it modified exactly, yeah, right, there. And it modified one resource, three seconds, and here's the browser, and refresh it to say, yeah, right. And so now take a break. Uh, yeah. Right now it is 6.54, we resume at seven. Awesome. So take a short break. Let me walk away. So I will be walking away a little bit and uh, I'll grab water and come back. The microphones and cameras are active.
Hey guys, I'm back. Show me how to change a directory in Atom. Okay, just click on the item. That's it. Yeah, but see, I'm stuck in Atom in my user directory in the SSH directory. Okay, let's see. Let's go take a look at what you have. Because oh. I, I made a mistake on one of my files. Oh, no worries. Let's go see. The default file, it appears. Uh, the default is a folder, not a file. Oh, well, there's a default.rb. Aha, you are in the other location. You're not in the, you're in the dot SSH location. I know, how do I get out of here? Control W, Control W, Control W, three times. And don't save. So keep control W's and control Q will quit. Okay, so you can see up here I made a mistake somehow in that oh, deep. No so we can we can fix this. This is easy to fix. So you yeah. are currently in uh, local mode cache. You want to go back four steps. CD dot 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 like four times. CD dot dot two. One, so no no not like this. No so dot dot two at a time. So two dots at a time. Without, uh, you have to have a space in between. It's not like Windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep coming back, please, all the way. Three more times. Or you can just hit uh, CD space dot dot slash dot dot. Yeah, that way also. Now, uh, now you're back home, so you, you have to go enter using Chef Solo. So CD using Chef Solo. The tab, no, not USR. Oops. Capital U, and then tab. Capital? Yeah, U is capital in using. Oh, it has to be capital T. That's right. Yeah, I know. Just uh, tab it. Tab, tab it. No, tab. no slash. No slash. Because your directory is in the present working directory, so. Yeah. That's true. Sweet. So now you have in the right location. Now here you open atom space dot. DOC? No, D O D O T like like a t dot. Just yeah. dot. Hit hit that. Period. Period. No period. Novice <laughs> 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 no, user. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, dot means right here. Dot gotcha. Right here. Okay. Oh. You can tell me how a little bit. I'm keep getting the um, WordPress, you know, coming up as I ask you. Uh, you want to share your screen, sir? Uh, I think yeah. it is because uh, you have uh, opened that before with HTTPS and it is cached. Probably that's why if you uh, refresh the browser, access local co local host with HTTP, you should go to the. Uh, uh, I, I did. Uh, HTTP. Yeah, can you share your screen, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So just refresh. I think you have a, from a previous run, you have Docker running. So I think uh, your solution is to kill Docker. I'll give you a command to kill Docker in Slack chat. So it is coming in Slack chat. The way to kill all running occurrences of Docker from a previous okay, run. Okay. So no wonder it's uh, coming alive. Exactly. Uh, for our friends, our you have to kill all Docker by running this command. It should be in your Slack chat. That's how you get rid of all the previous iterations of Docker command, and that will clean up. Rm minus f, rm dash f. That's great. So kill it, kill it all, and now Docker is gone. Ps dash a is all empty. Oh no wonder, because Docker is there. So, so because he was resurrected all the time. So, so from the session where we tried the tried running Docker in daemon mode. Okay, I fixed it. 
Awesome. Yes, sir. That's great. So in Thank you. <laughs> yep. So in here, now you should be able to just do whatever you want uh, and it will work because yep. the last time it was conflicting with your Docker. Okay. It was the same port, port number 80 is occupied. Ah, I see, I see. I the port number 80 was occupied, now it is not. And so you refresh and you get nothing found. Yeah, look, okay. look I yeah, install good. other things, just go localhost, enter. And yeah, great. Got it. Thank you. So, how do I exit that? Yeah, you just close the browser and that's it. You want to also. Uh, remember that you have state change. No, I mean uh, how the uh, control Q. Control Q. Oh, here, okay. Or on my other screen. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So uh, what we are doing essentially is uh, making sure that we are remembering that we change the state of our computers. What does that mean? Let me describe that a little bit. So in example that I want to talk about is that. You know, just like we had uh, this, uh, the state that in our machine was that the original state I thought was a raw machine to begin with, it was not raw. It was probably stale, a stale machine from, from a previous Docker run. And that caused conflicts. You know, you, you cannot occupy the same port with Apache wanting to get the same port, doesn't work. So you have to begin with a clean slate. And so our state was not clean, it was stale. And so we cleaned it up and then begin. Then it, then, it's, then it works. When you begin from fresh, begin from raw, it will maintain the state for you. So the cleanup was, the cleanup needed from a previous run was Docker, RMF, RM, uh, sorry, I typed it in Slack chat. So remove all the containers, Docker PS-A should show empty, and then your machine is clean. Uh, there is nothing left over from a previous occurrence. So that's gone, gone. And now it will work. By, by working, I would like to say that there is no such thing as, uh, you know, uh, we're not trying to tell how to do things. This is not what we do. We tell what. What do you want the outcome to be? We are prescriptive. We don't describe, we say, what do we want? And that's the outcome. So it accomplishes the outcome for us. If you study the cookbook itself, you can probably see a whole lot of detail in here. The main cookbook is simple. It has two components now. One is the file component, which is where we are giving the index file. And with the modifications I did here, yeah, right, like that. So we modify that again. And the other component we have is a recipe. This is the default recipe, which is the main thing that we want to do, is to install, start, enable, and place this file. Four things. That's the outcome we define in this location, and we call that out in the DNA. The DNA JSON says, run the default recipe in the main cookbook. That's the DNA definition. So you inject that DNA onto a machine, it will produce the outcome you want. How, it does, how does it do? That question is a fairly elaborate question. And that is defined in this body of knowledge known as cookbook. If you go to that location, you will find that this cookbook is a little bit old, but that doesn't matter. It still works. This versions of cookbooks have been changing over the last so many years. So I don't even know which version that cookbook is, but maybe it is given, you have to read the cookbook itself. So if you go and start reading the cookbook itself, you will find that a cookbook has these standardized folders as references that you will find in almost every cookbook, you will have these things called attributes and definitions and some files. In the default folder, there are some Apache modules, general configuration defined. There are some recipes, or not some, but a ton of recipes here. So you can see all these recipes called out, and you can make use of these 
and there are lots and lots of them it's basically a recipe for every module that is available as a part of the apache package so we are using just the default recipe which is this one that's the recipe we are really invoking in our in our scenario this cookbook if you go and read in detail a little bit you will find that the flow of the cookbook is very english like because it is ruby it reads like english language almost like english language so uh, if you go start reading that cookbook you will get a glimpse of how it is doing like it says you know find out which machine are we on are we on red hat linux or fedora linux or suzy linux in that case we know that at least the apache cookbook creator knows that the service has to be named httpd unless it is debian like in our case the service has to be called apache 2 or <coughs> in case of arch linux the service has to be called httpd and by the way the restart commands for red hat and fedora and suzy are like this whereas the restart command for debian and ubuntu are like this so they have defined already for us if you keep scrolling that down it's a huge huge file by the way it goes into great depth in making sure that you have the flexibility of configuring this particular application in the way that you will do <coughs> for all the supported operating systems defined in that particular cookbook at those days it was when i have this version of cookbook it doesn't have reference to windows but today i think there is a reference to windows so this this cookbook is a little bit old but you will find if you go and study the cookbook itself that they will define how to do these things in windows and the how part is collected <coughs> the how part the how to do something is defined by uh, the cookbook collections these guys typically define how to do these things most of the time most of the time most large open source projects already have cookbooks created which means we can just go to the supermarket and search for a particular cookbook you want just search for it here and say that i want apache 2 go and you will get one you want some database like my sequel database there is a cookbook for that this one and you want to get another database like mongo there is going to be a cookbook for that and just imagine every every uh uh thing that you would like to get in any open source project that is uh, uh let's call it generally used by lots of people they will also create a corresponding cookbook so that people who are using chef will make use of the cookbook itself another database here is postgresql there will be a cookbook for that right here and so like that you can just make use of these cookbooks fairly easily <coughs> and thank these guys from this company called heavy water who has prepared this postgresql for themselves primarily they they these guys contribute their work because i think it helps them in running their business so heavy water Corp operations llc uh, these guys have created this particular postgres cookbook and a bunch of other cookbooks because if they use it in their business and they find that sharing it in the open source community will help them improve the cookbook their work themselves and that's the reason why people share and this 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 open source movement that has been happening for so many years now and is the primary dominant force these days you you see microsoft contributing microsoft open sourcing a ton of great products already in, in, and i think the last comment i hear from satya uh on the news was that microsoft is the biggest contributor to open source projects in uh, github which was amazing to see that and so companies are doing this because it helps not only themselves but also the community at large so everybody gets to benefit 
and that's the reason why uh, open source is so so popular and we we primarily use open source in this particular program the idea essentially is that we rely on the work done by i would call them giants and we stand on the shoulders of these giants to do our work so we, we learn from them so we don't have to worry about how to do things but we just define to begin with what and we just use it as a beginning step once we grow in terms of understanding our depth of usage then we can eventually grow into this creation of our own custom cookbooks that modifies the behavior of established cookbooks already so we want to something specific and yes we will do exercises like that you know so we will have a community cookbook for example this one that we will take and modify this is the my sequel cookbook at some point you will create another cookbook based on the my sequel cookbook but you will call it something different in fact you will call it your sequel cookbook that's the exact name i have chosen your sequel as opposed to just a play of word so basically it's a derivative cookbook of the my sequel cookbook that you will create at some point in the, another exercise but essentially what you're doing is relying on the work most of the work that these guys have already done modifying the cookbook to suit your business scenario that you might have and then use it use whatever they have provided extend extend it with your idea and then make use of this idea this is custom for you this idea is customized for your use case so we'll have those examples coming up it is written already in the in the website you will find those if you are if you are looking at that ahead but it, it's i think couple of uh, exercises down you will find it eventually so now this concept of what we just discussed is this idea of this uh, use of chef it it requires a collection of things known as cookbooks which is a general purpose description it's a collection of recipes if you will and these recipes are are very prescriptive in defining what to do this how to do that how to do this and they go on and on it's a huge collection mostly so every cookbook is structured in form of a collection of recipes it may also have a folder called attributes which will keep track of specific things around whatever that application is going to do so in our example of apache you will have apache specific attributes defined in this location in the attributes folder under the apache cookbook so we will see that you will go here in the folder and like the recipes folder you have a attributes folder and in there there are these default attributes and here you will see that it says that i would like my log directory to be this you can modify it to put your log in a different location if you like but by default these are the same defaults given to us same defaults whatever makes most sense these same defaults are already prescribed for this particular package in the attributes folder whatever sane values are are already written down as a best practice so whatever best practice is for using that particular piece of application that is generally accepted in the community is written down already in form of sane default attributes and those things are in the cookbook attributes folder like here attributes folder and there are a bunch of attribute files one is the default attribute file these are ruby language representations basically calling out something very very specific for example uh, the <coughs> when the operating system is free bsd your log directory needs to be this as opposed to when the operating system is ubuntu then the log directory needs to be this so the subtle differences across operating systems that defining these things for debian and ubuntu the log directory needs to be that location and you can see these examples in across the board 
operating system by operating system, for example, here, all these OSs are basically very similar. So the Oracle Linux and the Amazon Linux and the Suzy Linux and Fedora and all these guys are conceptually derived from the same Red Hat family. That's why they are all clubbed together in detection of what this thing is, the underlying platform. When the case is Red Hat platform or any of these guys, you want to use these defaults. Among there is included this default, same default value, VAR log HTTP. I'm just picking on the log directory as an example default, uh, example attribute. But that has been defined already, so we don't have to worry about where things go. And these values are basically derived from the documentation of the appropriate package. So there is this documentation for Apache, by the way, is available on the Apache Foundation's website, which is Apache Foundation, as you know already. Apache is a web server, and the Apache Foundation is a larger uh, foundation uh, taking care of Apache related products. But the original thing at least began with Apache and now it has a huge, huge collection of projects. If you go look at the Apache product, where is Apache here? By name, HTTP server. And so here is the Apache project, httpd, apache.org. And they will have documentation for every version that you have and they will describe what should be the default values for a variety of attributes to run a variety of scenarios for this particular version of Apache Web Server 2.4. So you will see those things documented in form of these attributes so that people don't have to worry about, things will automatically get selected, the correct recommended sane default attributes. They come up from this folder, which is a part of the cookbook. So they define where attributes are sitting. You can just grab it from there. And the cookbooks and the recipes that will run will automatically invoke the appropriate attribute as it runs. You can <clears throat> see a whole lot more detail if you actually you know, read every file in here. But our goal is to not go jump deeper right away but instead understand what these things are from a top level perspective and then go slowly under the hood and understand what are these things doing for us. So from a, <clears throat> from a usage perspective, uh, from, from a beginning usage perspective, the idea is to grab a cookbook from the community like supermarket, for example, and just uh, make it work for us. So you have right now an example of this thing called using Chef Solo as an example project that you just ran. And this project uses a cookbook from the supermarket called the Apache cookbook. And so what I would like to do <coughs> as the next exercise is to ask you this question. What would it take for me to say that, you know what, this Apache server is quite heavy in terms of its, its uh, thing that it does for us. And our weight, that uh, our application requirements need a lightweight web server. Apache is probably very heavy for us. Apache 2 is quite heavy. I need a lightweight web server. So I go look for it and I find that there is this server called Nginx, which is a very lightweight web server and it is pretty capable. So I, I want to get rid of this. Yeah, that is not really suited for my lightweight application. I, I want to be this. So that's my goal. I just, I'm changing my desire. So I just change my desire now. My desire is to do the same project like we did, we did with Apache, but that is too heavy for a project. So no, get rid of it. But instead, use this. 
That's what I would like to see. And so how would you do it? How would you think about beginning to modify in here? What would you change? The first thing to do is probably get rid of this folder altogether. So let's say go bye-bye. Okay, gone. Now what? Now what? I want to get this. But now what? What do I do? I got rid of Apache. Now what? Anybody? You want to rerun your... You're trying to get Apache? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I want to get rid of Apache. Oh. And get this. So this is a different server. Yep. So go get a new recipe. A cookbook, yes. Correct. A cookbook, yeah. Yeah. So this is the Nginx server that I would like to actually run. And this is available in open source. So don't go to this site because this is the Nginx Plus product, which is not free, not open source. So we want to go to the Nginx source, which is on GitHub. Very likely everything is on GitHub. So here it is. It's a mirror of the actual repository, which is a mercurial repository, by the way. And it's an official read-only mirror. So it mirrors whatever the original repository is, which is not a Git repository, apparently. It is mercurial here. And so that repository is mercurial repository, where Nginx source code is sitting, and it was updated 12 hours ago. And so that's the change. So here's the source code. That's great. So this is the mercurial repository, but we are just using Git. So we are going to do the replica. The replica, the mirror, the Git mirror is right here. That's the source code. And it is updated 12 hours ago, and the same exact things will populate right here because it's a read-only mirror. So now this is the source code. But that's not what I want. I want to get a cookbook. So I'll go to the supermarket. And there I will search for a cookbook. I will call the Nginx cookbook, look for it. So here it is, the Nginx cookbook. That's created by Mike the man. And this is the man who did it. And I think I want to caution you with one thing. Although I, I know these guys are good, but in open source, not everything has to be good to begin with. So you have to be very careful in picking a project from here because anybody and everybody can actually create a cookbook and dump it right here in the collection by the name Nginx, by the way. There may be name conflicts, so you have to modify it. You have to be very careful on looking at whether this is the right collection of work that people are actually using. Are people using this? So let's go view the source. So go see the source and watch how many people are actually forking it, watching it contributing it, two people contributing, 39 commits, uh, pull requests are there, so there is some activity going on, issues are there, issues are closed, issues are closed, pull requests are closed, so lots and lots of activity seems to be happening, there are 742 forks, so there is activity here, and this is actually a very good cookbook, so that's how you can detect a good one from a bad one, a bad or rather not so popular, it doesn't have to be bad, it's not so popular cookbook is indicated by lack of watchers and stars and ports. Not many people do these things. If the, if, the, if the book is not popular, you will not see activity. So here are 5,872 commits, and that's awesome. You will also see that there are 30 contributors. You probably recognize some of these by name if you know some of these people. But forget the naming part, the fact that there are so many commits, is a good chance that this is a good product. Similarly, you have to go look at the underlying cookbook also. So like I, I just changed to the source of the product itself. That's how the numbers jumped and I, I got a little bit of surprise there. But let's go, go back to the supermarket. And here we go look at the Nginx cookbook, which is different from the Nginx product. So this source is the cookbook for Nginx. It has 39 comments. The source code for Nginx is different. 
So it has more comments, by the way, to the actual source code for Nginx, <coughs> which has 5,872 comments. So this is a different thing. This is the source of the application itself. Whereas this is the cookbook created by Mike the Man to deploy Nginx services, which is also not bad, 742. So it is not a, nobody uses this kind of a scenario. People are actually using it. That's how you can go and detect whether it's a decent cookbook to actually make use of. Then once you have it, you can download the cookbook from that location by clicking that button. To click the download button, and that's how you can obtain. So you should go open that in the browser here. Instead of, instead of doing it on your machine, open the browser inside in the virtual machine and type Nginx here. And that's easier to download because you are now downloading the cookbook for Nginx directly on the virtual machine as opposed to downloading it on your computer. So it's easier. You don't have to move things around. So you can download the cookbook and save it in the location where you're supposed to be saving your cookbooks. So you have this Nginx zip file. It's a tarball, by the way. And this tarball downloaded. You want to move this item after you expand it into the cookbooks folder. That's where you want it to go. So we will do exactly that. We know that in our using chef solo folder here, we want to double click on it and <clears throat> open that folder, then go into cookbooks. And that's where I need Nginx right there. What I have is this TGZ file, which is a zip file or a tarball file or tar gzip file. I'm going to right click on it and open for easier extract here. That's a whole lot easier. Just extract here and click and it does. So you get the outcome right there. This Nginx folder needs to be moved to this location. That's good. That's what I wanted. My cookbooks folder to contain the Nginx cookbook. That's exactly what I wanted. So I can get rid of this zip file, move it to trash, gone. And now my cookbook folder actually contains an Nginx cookbook right there. <coughs> How did I get this? I obtained it from this location. And I did all these things inside the Firefox browser because it makes file movement very easy. I can just drag and drop into the cookbook folder. And after extraction, I have this entire folder ready for use. Now, what else need to change for this thing to basically run Nginx as opposed to running Apache? Right now, if you look at, it runs Apache. So we need to kill those guys, right? So we need to kill Apache completely and make room for it, make room for Nginx, because it will also take the same port, port number 80. So I want to kill those guys, kill dash nine, and then start killing 2651, 2654, 2655, and say bye-bye. And so it kills. Now we have no Apache there. Nice. Now we'll also uninstall Apache. For example, you know that action, uh, sudo apt get uh, remove Apache 2 and also remove the auto remove the unneeded dependencies. So we'll remove that also. Sudo so remove that. And now we have no trace of Apache on our box. Nice. So we have removed all the Apache references from a runtime and the machine deployment. All of that is gone. So we don't have any Nginx process running, which means our browser on localhost should show unable to connect. And there we have it. So it's unable to connect because there's nothing running. So now I want to run Nginx in the same way like I did Apache except do this cookbook way. 
this chef way of doing things. So let's begin from the beginning point here. This is the same binary that will execute. The same solo RB says my cookbooks are stored here and my JSON is that file. So that's the JSON. The JSON says run the main cookbook default recipe in there. So I need to go look at the main cookbook default recipe, which is right here. And main <coughs> recipe, main cookbook default recipe says Apache which is not what I want. So I want to remove that. I'll say double click and remove the references of Apache with Nginx and save. Also, this is incorrect because that's not where Nginx stores it. In fact, Nginx stores this thing in a different location called user share. Nginx HTML. That's the location for Nginx. So you have to know this by reading the documentation for that application called Nginx. It will tell you where it stores its files. I know because I've done it so many times. That's the location. And we can confirm that. If it fails, we have to go modify that. But I think I'm pretty damn sure that's the location. So we save that location and Nginx is going to run. And we also have our Nginx cookbook right there because we downloaded it. So that's how you would like to modify. And so our main file here, this one, it says UC Chef really works. You can make it say now with Nginx. And then save. So at least you will know that we have made some changes here. And we close, close, close all and then go back to the same way of running Chef, which is basically the same exact way that we have been running all along, is to just run it. <coughs> and it will find that you do not have Nginx installed, so it will install it for you and run it for you, enable the state and put the resource in the right location, which is what we see here, now running Nginx. And that was placed in the appropriate location already. And so now we should just open up our browser and refresh to see now running Nginx. But that doesn't tell you that it is running Nginx. But you can check by running the Nginx processes, which is and here they are. Nginx processes running. We can begin to kill them and identify that it doesn't run anymore so our nginx processes are all dead <coughs> by the way this reference is not a nginx reference but it's a grep reference that is what you ran so it shows an entry for that this line is not an nginx line it's the grep line that is this line that you run here so it exited <clears throat> so we have killed our nginx guys we should go back here and see that everything is dead and doesn't work anymore so you go to localhost and it's unable to connect. Now we can do the same thing this time and run chef one more time. And it will run. And it will basically do only one action. And that action is to start the dead service, which we killed right here. So now we should be able to see it back up line, live up and running like this. And we can repeat the steps, which is to completely erase Nginx from this machine. So sudo app get auto remove, no, 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 just remove Nginx and get rid of it. Now we have to run the auto remove part also, which is to clean up the other unneeded stuff 
that comes along when you don't need a package, it will auto remove other things. And it will get rid of all the other things. So now you will have the, all the traces of Nginx gone. You can also check for processes running Nginx, which we don't have any. And we have our machine dead, unable to connect. Now come back again and run Chef one more time. It will find that Nginx is missing, so it will install it. And then start it, enable it, put the file, and all done. And here we go. Refresh, and you see it running. And you, go, you, you see this, this, there are only two actions, install action and updated content. That's pretty much was, that was needed. So two actions were done in five seconds. And now we have a running solution back to exactly what we desired in our design, which was the desired state that I wanted to accomplish. So the idea was we began with a initial design of Apache and we got the outcome implemented. Then we said, you know what, put my HTML. And so we implemented that. We are not touching the machines directly. By the way, as you know, we are saying that, you know what, operate through the chef way of doing things. So we are putting our desires in this location. This is our first desire, second desire. Then the third desire was to, you know, get rid of Apache and use Nginx instead. No problem. And we can keep modifying our desire. You can call it desire or call it design. It's the same thing, whatever you want. The outcome will be enabled exactly according to what you want. That's the idea behind these tools. So we, we just started using these things. We'll go a whole lot deeper because the thing is complex. And so just so you understand, you know, application deployment is not trivial. You need to understand how things will go, understand great level of depth in terms of how to run something for real, for real customer usage. And then define that out in your, uh, whatever your desire is. You can call it a kitchen, call it whatever you call it. Just put some folder in a Git repository in a structured fashion and then run these two links they will enable the outcome for you. That's the, the ultimate goal of uh, uh, these using tools like uh, Chef, for example, and uh, enabling scenarios around DevOps. So <clears throat> let's close out on this topic. Uh, and there are some things for you to do on your own. I think they are here. So this solo, uh, you running chef in solo mode, your, your first solo run was a trivial run, you know, literally very trivial, very simple. When you saw it, you ran it, you did this Nginx business modification as a, was it here or maybe, not, maybe in the next page. So somewhere along the line, you will find Nginx modify the project to use Nginx web server instead of Apache. So you, you, you saw me do that. The, the next idea is to go a little bit deeper in understanding, uh, which is what we will do the next time, which is to see how Chef Solo works in a slightly more elaborate fashion. And this, <clears throat> of course, involves uh, a little bit more understanding of what a kitchen is and what are the components behind that go in putting things together in form of a place for you to put the desire that you have, the outcome, the design that you want to put, you put all these things in a kitchen, at least in the context of chef. So what is a kitchen? Kitchen is a folder, simple. It's a place to store stuff. You can make it complex, make it Git repository, use a chef server to store your kitchen and all that. But at the end of the day, it's a folder. That's where you write down things that I want this to happen and this tooling will make it happen. That's what we'll do next time, which is this idea of running through that elaborate sequence. And yes, it is elaborate, 
but once you get the concept it's not difficult to understand it is just elaborate it, it's lots of moving parts and you want to make sure that it it resembles your real life scenario so you, you will have lots of parts just like in real life so uh, the idea is just like real life your kitchen in the context of using the chef tool is to write down your desire and this guy will implement for you and just like in real life there are lots and lots of things to worry about so you just write them down right here and it is actually beautiful in terms of understanding how to write things because effectively you are writing either ruby code which you may not realize but you did today you wrote ruby you wrote some html and you also used some json so these are the two dominant uh, uh, uses we will have some some html writing so basically some snippets that's not the focus the focus is to understand and make tools like this actually implement what your customers may want so to deliver services to them what does it take to build out not the application so we are not an app developer uh, group so we are not developing applications but we are basically understanding what does it take to run a complete stack out in the cloud in form of a service for our customers in an automated fashion and so the, the goal is that we will take some example application, a very well known popular application that all of us probably know of or already use, is called WordPress. That application, <coughs> I think it runs, uh, how many sites run WordPress? Let's go see. So there it is, the answer. There are 74 million sites depending on WordPress. That's one site per person in Turkey. Okay. And this doesn't, uh, accounts for 50% is hosted on the free side in the realm of So you can even see some stacks. And uh, yeah, pretty, pretty darn good <coughs> application. Very, very elaborate. Created by this gentleman. Uh, his name is Matt. His website is called ma.tt. And uh, Where is he? Where is that? Yeah, this guy. So uh, he created that WordPress application a while ago and he's been contributing on it and we are just using that application. The application itself is available on this website. It's downloadable from here. And there is a ton of documentation. And by the way, this guy, Matt, runs a company called automatic.com automatic and so that company runs a service called wordpress.com which is not wordpress I mean, it is not the wordpress software this is a service this is not the software the software is available at the .org location that's where you get the software from so that developers, bunch of them, they all communicate and collaborate to create WordPress. And that source code is sitting right here. And it has 35,000 commits and 34 contributors. And these are core contributors and heavy activity going on. So you can see the activity and how much activity people are doing to make this software work. And I think it's a pretty darn good software, no doubt about it. And tons of uh, work happens uh, all along. You see that last commit happened six hours ago. And it is open source, so that's what you're looking at. By the way, this is a, a mirror. It's not the original location. Where the source code sits, this is not the original location. This is a read-only mirror. This repository is just a mirror of the WordPress subversion repository. They still or use the old subversion, for example, and you can see the source code on that location. This is the original source where it comes from, subversion. And somewhere along here, you can put uh, uh, the, I, th I don't think they expose the subversion repository publicly. 
you can only create tickets on the subversion uh, track website. So the source code is available as such in this location on GitHub, but it is read-only mirror. Because they are used to using subversion from historical times, they're just using that one. They did not actually migrate over to Git, which doesn't matter. So that's what you're looking at. That's the application I will be using uh, as an example to go in depth in uh, terms of running uh, a variety of scenarios in, a, in, in the outcome that we want to accomplish, which is basically from a top level perspective, understand what does it take to run this in form of a service. So we have to read those documentation that requires all the dependencies. What are the dependencies that we have for this thing to run correctly? And that's what we need to understand. So that is available in documentation that we will read, but I will just tell you that we don't have to worry too much about it. The dependencies are essentially known as the LAMP stack. That's what is needed. It stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. The PHP language, MySQL database, Apache server, and Linux as the operating system. That's what is needed. It is the classical uh, thing that is known as the LAMP stack. People have modified it, used Windows in place of it to call it the WAMP stack. People have also modified it to call it the LAMP stack, which is this E stands for Nginx. <coughs> and uh, uh, that limp, limp stack, it also runs on all these stacks, by the way. WordPress will run on all these guys. As long as you have some operating system, some kind of a web server, and some database that works kind of sort of like MySQL, it will work. So since this is acquired by Oracle, uh, many people don't want to use this anymore uh, because of the connection of uh, Big Brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did I say that? Yes, I did. So uh, what people have done is created a, a derivative of this instead known as MariaDB. And that is pure open source GPL. So it works nicely. And it's a, basically a drop in replacement of this. So you will have Linux, Apache, Maria. Uh, PHP that also works. So basically, you can modify whatever stack that you want and construct. And in general, in the open source community, there is this trend towards creating four letter acronyms like this, for example, as the platform that is needed to run a variety of applications, such as one of them is WordPress, which you already know now. Uh, another one, a very famous one, is called Drupal. This is what Obama runs on the White House website. Whitehouse.gov, it runs Drupal. This is also another open source project created by Dries, uh, which also basically broadly uses this stack. And you can see more on Drupal.org. This guy, Dries, runs a service by the name of drupalgardens.com, which is basically a service running Drupal sites. So you can see that Drupal Gardens, uh, Drupal Gardens is uh, this site. And, oh, it ended? Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, great. So they stopped doing it apparently which is fine. <laughs> I did not know that. I thought they still have it. <coughs> but this product is open source. And uh, that's what the White House runs. This site. It's a very well known, uh, very popular site. And uh, like that, there are more open source products that all use the same stack. And that another one is Joomla which is very similar again, 
looks different, functions conceptually same. Uh, very popular content management systems, these things are. So you, you have basically a place to store and display content access controls and all these things. Very nicely implemented. All these applications are available in open source. And you have in Windows land, this thing called .NET Nuke. Uh, .NET Nuke is, I think it requires Windows and then .NET and then add .NET Nuke to get the thing running. So let's go see .NET Nuke. I haven't run it in a while, but it is there. Oh, no, not this. A web-based CMS platform that powers, where is the source code? Not this, this is the commercial derivation of that. So I want to go to the source of .NET Nuke, which should be Coreplex. So this is the old Microsoft code repository for oh, we moved. Oh, Microsoft has moved to GitHub. There we go. By the way, all of documentation at Microsoft is now on GitHub, which is a nice surprise. So all MSDN documentation, if you go look at MSDN, it is all migrated to GitHub these days, apparently. So let's go see some documentation, API references, and go look at not Windows Phone, but something interesting. So let's go Azure document DB. And that document, I bet, is going to be on GitHub. All these documentations are on GitHub. So you can go see that this reference that you have is actually sitting somewhere on GitHub. So let's go see where it is. So you can go modify uh, to the source code and GitHub. And there it is. This is the documentation for the same thing I like saw on, on GitHub, which you can see the documentation is probably here. And so this is the sample. And is this created by Microsoft? No, there should be a Microsoft repository for that same thing. Azure content, this one, not that one, but here. So this is the document DB hierarchical resource model and concepts. The whole documentation, as you see on MSDN, actually is coming from GitHub. So these people are Microsoft employees that are modifying your uh, Azure content for documentation. There are 1,606 contributors. I am probably one of them uh, because I have modified your documentation after I left Microsoft, not before. And uh, these people that are making, uh, some of them are core contributors and they are collectively writing uh, MSDN documentation. So here is, I think, vendor. You can, you can see that this guy is a vendor at Microsoft and he's writing the documentation at GitHub. And that, that's what you're looking at. So um, coming back, this DNN software is also on GitHub on the core platform, which is you can run it with uh, these, uh, the, the, you can take this source code, run it on a Windows machine. Windows itself is not open source. But uh, the underlying things like the .NET platform itself is now open source, as I understand. Uh, so you should find .NET on GitHub already, like here. And so this is the Microsoft .NET, and you can install the .NET Nuke on top of the .NET platform and run it on a Windows box. And that's how you can get that other application running that I was talking about, which is this one, .NET Nuke. There's a chat message. Not not for not for right now. We'll talk about that later. So uh, uh, the DNN application is just another one. Another another little acronym that people have come up with is called the Mean Stack, which is stands for Mongo, the database, Express, the web server, Angular as the framework for JavaScript, and Node. Node is the application, Node.js is the application that runs on the back end. It is also JavaScript, but it sits on the back end of the machine as a server. And this makes both front end as well as back end, both JavaScript. And that's the mean stack. And this Node.js is actually originated in this company that we discussed earlier on, Joyant. 
and they are the original creators of Node. So, uh, where is the Node reference? Node. Yeah, here. So you can see Node.js in production uh, made easy through that company. They are the creators of that. Actually, the, the developer, I don't know what the relationship is, but there's some ownership apparently. So Node.js, if you go, I think the, Mr. Dahl is the name of the guy who created that Node.js application. I think that will pop up right here. Node.js.org. And this is the source code for that. Uh, and uh, there is a reference to Joint at the bottom. My Node.js is a trademark of Joint, and like that. So uh, that's what you're looking at. You can see uh, the source code. Get the source code for Node from here. Node itself is built on the browser called Chrome. So this Chrome browser that you're looking at, this browser, the, yeah, the V8 engine. Uh, the v8 engine that runs the chrome browser on your desktops is used under the hood by this application node to make make this component so the browser that sits on the front end is the engine part of it the v8 engine like microsoft ie has a chakra engine or maybe a newer engine these days uh, that engine is in google chrome is called v8 engine that is what is used in the back end to run javascript on the server side using this application, which is open source. And V8 is also open source. And, and by the way, Chrome is also open source. And not Chrome, but Chromium. <coughs> Chromium is the open source project, which is available here. And that is the original open source on which Google has created the browser called Google Chrome which is a derivative of the open source project called Chromium. Similarly, there is a Chromium OS, which is open source product, which is how they have created the Chrome OS machines. So you can see Chromebook and Chrome boxes. Those are basically derivatives of the Chromium project, this one. And that's the origin of open source on these uh, tools and techniques. So back, back to what we will discuss next time is is to basically understand in the context of an application, what does it take to basically go down deeper in the track and construct our desire and have tools like Chef or Docker or Ansible or any of those things implement and maintain our state of the cloud, state of the cloud, our cloud our specific cloud for this application that we want to provide to our customers as a service. That's the goal. We want to maintain the state of our cloud, implement the state of our cloud, mention and write down our desire and have these tools take care of it as opposed to we going and mucking around with the machines directly, which is exactly not what I want to do. I don't want anybody in our company to be touching those production boxes at all at all and you see this in large companies they have discipline around it uh, some smaller companies are trying to accomplish similar discipline but you know having a discipline is a good thing and a bad thing if you put too much discipline you know the agility goes down so you want to have discipline in the way things operate but let people have the freedom to change the desire in a collective fashion and this desires keep changing based on customer need. Customer needs change and you want to service that need, you will modify your design to service that need, but you don't make those changes in the cloud directly. You go back to your blueprint, your design. You make your change in here. Put that in a git commit and then go home because this this tooling will take care of it from the commit and implement your design you make a mistake no problem just reward the commit and that's it you go home this tooling will apply the reverted commit and your oops will be corrected and customers will continue to be happy. 
you don't have to go mark with the production directly. Just go do it in your in your internal tools, in your design, in your desire. Work with the team, identify what you want, make changes, or revert from changes, whatever you want. But the tooling will help you accomplish that. That's the goal. So we'll do more of this next time. Questions? Or too tired no, of listening? No questions. No questions? That's, that's OK. Yeah, so we'll be, uh, uh, we'll try to exercise. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can proceed ahead. There's yeah. nothing wrong with proceeding ahead. So go ahead, go ahead with proceed ahead if you like. Uh, if you want to wait for me, that's totally cool. I will run through those exercises for you. The first exercise will focus on using Chef Solo to get you a good understanding. Once you have that understanding on a using solo mode, we'll then switch over to using the Chef Server, Chef Client mode, and go deeper. In understanding a variety, we'll we change the topics a little bit, include other technologies as, as, we, as we need to. And uh, the core is to, to get a solid perspective on at least one tool in depth and a flavor of some other tools to go along. And then you can choose and pick which tool works best for a given situation and maybe adopt that. So not every tool will work for every situation. There are some variations to in how these tools work. And so it really boils down to what your customer scenarios are and then apply the appropriate tooling for a particular outcome. So we'll, we'll discuss some of these differences uh, at appropriate times, but I just want to make sure that you at least get one tool in depth. So that chef is quite deep, you have in the, in the write-ups here. Tons of exercises available and uh, you know, they will work. So you give it a shot, give it a shot. And I'll, I'll follow along, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm not going away. And as you're doing exercise on your own, if you run into an issue, you can always chat and come back on a one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Nilesh. Thanks. Awesome. So thank you, guys. And we are meeting again next time. When is that? I keep forgetting about that. Oh, we are doing a free session on Docker for public. Uh, you may find it uh, boring or interesting or not, but if you want to join, it's Friday, 10 o'clock. So just so you know. It's a public session for everybody. And then our next session is Thursday. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. I'm stopping recording.